Hi. The technology available in the film world today is nearly unrecognisable compared to the technology that was available when the ideas of moving photographs was little more than an emerging concept. One element of the camera that was constantly being redesigned and reimagined was the film itself. Yep, today I'd like to take you through a brief history of film stock and its various formats. The history of film stock starts, as you would expect, side by side with the history of the film camera. And that leads us to this guy, William Dixon. The year is 1883, and William Dixon, an engineer and inventor, has just been hired by Thomas Edison. Edison is aiming to create a machine that can animate still photographs, similar to the way that hand-drawn animation works. The biggest thing necessary to get this particular ball rolling was a way to record various still images. Enter film stock. The earliest motion picture tests done on Edison's patented machine, the kinetograph, were done on paper roll film. As you can expect, this film was flimsy and wasn't very good at recording or displaying a clear image. The solution to this, and our first major innovation, celluloid film reels. Coated in a photosensitive gelatin emulsion, these celluloid film reels were first produced by the Eastman Kodak Company in 1889. These rolls of film came with another complication, however. Exposing this revolving reel to light over time simply yielded a blurry mess and not clean sharp images. This new problem required a new solution. And what was that new solution? Sprocket holes or perforations. That'll be important later. Dixon cut holes in the edges of the film stock, which meant that he could use a sprocket to periodically load sections of the film so that they could be exposed to light and then a new section of film could then be rotated over. This was done in conjunction with the camera's shutter. Finally, we have a film reel that can sequentially capture still images and when played back, you guessed it, imitated movement. Moving pictures were a reality. However, this was just the beginning of the evolutionary chain for film, which would go on to see many other iterations, design changes, and formats over the years. Now, Edison and Dixon weren't the only ones working on the camera. Over in France, the Lumiere brothers were working on their own design known as the cinematograph. Improving on Edison and Dixon's design, the cinematograph not only recorded images, but was also able to develop the film and project them onto a screen. The cinematograph was portable, and it was also powered by a hand crank. This was different from the kinetograph, which was not only stationary, but required electricity in order to function. Edison saw the commercial success of the cinematograph, and also saw that his kinetograph was quickly becoming obsolete. And so he responded in the typical way that Edison does, by finding a pre-existing design that is better and slapping his name on it. In this case, it was the Vitascope. During this time, there was a big issue with film reels tearing due to strain and overuse with the machines. The solution to this and the next big innovation is the Latham Loop, named after its inventor, Woodville Latham. The Latham Loop was another patented design that introduced a new way of feeding the film stock into the projector in such a way that it had a loop of slack above and below the exposed film, meaning that it was more resistant to tear as it had less pressure on it. The Vitascope was a camera that used the Latham Loop design, and it was bought by Edison and renamed the Edison Vitascope. The Lumiere Brothers Company, Lumiere, had also begun developing and supplying film stock in Europe as early as 1896. And as film was growing over the next few decades and filmmaking was becoming more popular and the Eastman Kodak company was growing in its production, the Lumiere brothers decided to keep up by adapting their stock formula to match the speed of Eastman film. It was during these early years of the 20th century that standardization was finally being introduced into the world of film stock. This came particularly in the form of film gauge. Film gauge refers to the physical width of the film stock. During this period in the 1900s, when the Lumiere and Edison cameras were the most popular, the 35 meter film gauge defaulted to become the most dominant amongst the market because it was used in both cameras. Perforations, the sprocket holes I mentioned earlier, were never included in the film stock prior to 1909. Instead, filmmakers would have to make them themselves using a perforator. In 1909, however, Eastman Kodak began perforating their own film, which was far more reliable and consistent than doing it at home. Within the same year, the Motion Picture Patents Trust, headed of course by Thomas Edison, came to an agreement on a standardized film stock format. That being the 35mm gauge that was already so popular within the industry, and a 1.33 to 1 aspect ratio that was exactly 4 Eastman Kodak perforations high. This is a very significant moment in the history of film stock as it was the first time there was ever a standardization for film stock reels to adhere to. 
The next big innovation of film stock came with the introduction of synchronous sound. Silent films were on their way out as inventors were finding new ways to try and overcome technological limitations in order to find ways to record sound alongside visuals. One such way was with sound on film, which was a term used to describe the process of recording audio directly onto the film stock at the same time that it was recording images. This could be done either optically with a variable density track or magnetically with a variable area track. Two that are worth noting are RCA with Photophone and Fox with Movie Tone. Fox's Movie Tone and Warner Bros. Vitaphone both operated at 24 frames per second. The significance of this is ginormous, as it cemented 24 frames per second as the baseline conventional frame rate for film from the 1920s all the way through to now in the modern age. As you may recall me mentioning before, prior to sound on film, silent films were shot on film stock that had a 1.33 aspect ratio. This was also known as 4.3 aspect ratio. And it looks like this. An unfortunate side effect of sound on film was that it required space on the film stock for the soundtrack to go, which cut into the space needed for the image. This left the aspect ratio at a rather tall 1.19. People didn't like this, and the projectors definitely didn't like this. Various movie theatres all tried their hand at modifying their projectors to compensate for the new aspect ratio changes. This led to a significant lack of uniformity amongst theatre chains. A new uniformity was needed and decided upon in 1929 by the Society of Motion Picture Engineers who nominated a standardised projector aperture opening of 0.8 inches by 0.6 inches, returning to the much-loved 1.33 aspect ratio. But the drama doesn't end there. When the Society of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences threw their hat into the ring, they proposed an aperture opening of 0.825 by 0.6, or an aspect ratio of 1.375, which the SMPE finally agreed to. This would become known as the Academy Ratio, and was an innovation that would dominate the film stock market for over 20 years. Now, for the first 40 odd years, film negatives were orthochromatic, meaning that they were mainly sensitive to blue and green light. This was the most popular and essentially the only form of film stock print that was available. Panchromatic, on the other hand, was a film format that was far more sensitive to light across the colour spectrum and was far more accurate to real life, and although it was available in 1913, it was largely unused for a number of years. That is, until the 1920s when Kodak began offering it as a standard option, and as competitors began to sell panchromatic film, Kodak decided to lower the price to match that of orthochromatic. Within just five years, concluding roughly in 1930, orthochromatic film had been almost completely phased out, replaced with panchromatic, which had now become the new norm. However, the desire to achieve colour on film was still always there, and before major film stock changes, which we'll get into, there were two main ways of adding colour to film. The first is tinting, which is where an artist would go onto the film negatives and deliberately, by hand, colour in certain aspects of the film. This was largely inaccurate and inconsistent. The other way was toning, which was where you would take the film strip and you would soak it, giving it a complete wash of a specific colour. You can see that here in these examples. All this changed when Technicolor entered the scene our next big innovation for film stock. Another huge milestone in film, this can be attributed to these three gentlemen, and was the technique of placing a prism behind a lens that when it interrupted the oncoming light, it would split it into three separate colors, red, green, and blue, and would project them onto three separate monochromatic film reels. These three monochromatic film reels were all sensitive to one of these three colors. They would then be taken, coated in a complementary colour and then stamped together to create one coloured image. As brilliant an innovation as this was, it was still a very difficult one to adopt due to its complexity and cost. By 1950, Eastman Kodak had developed a single colour negative film stock that was far simpler and far cheaper than Technicolor, and so was quickly adopted by Hollywood, becoming the new standard for coloured film. Stepping back into the world of aspect ratios, the Academy ratio was still going strong. That was at least until 1952, when Cinerama kicked off the widescreen revolution. This set off a chain reaction of redesigns to film stock, as studios were striving to create wider aspect ratios, sharper images, and projected onto bigger screens. 
I will now do my very best to succinctly highlight some of the biggest developments in the film stock formats that took place over the last 70 years. Cinerama, which came out in 1952, was actually originally called the Waller Gunnery Trainer and was a simulation used to help war pilots before Fred Waller, the inventor, repurposed his design for film. Cinerama consisted of a three-camera build that would record all at the same time onto three separate film stocks. This would then be played again by three separate projectors onto a curved screen, creating a giant widescreen experience. How this was significant to film stock was that each camera shot on 35mm at 6 perf or a perfect square. When combining these three images together, you created a wide aspect ratio of 2.59. This widescreen experience gave the audience a taste of the immersion and scale that films were now capable of offering. Unfortunately, the Cinerama design required that theatres adjust or build new screens that could accommodate a curved design. This was just too complicated, it was too expensive, and so Cinerama never really took off. Its replacement came a year later with Cinemascope in 1953, which returned to Edison's 35mm 4 per format. However, this used a 2 to 1 anamorphic lens to squeeze an image onto the 1.33 aspect ratio of the film stock, and then another anamorphic lens on the projector to project back to a 2.35 aspect ratio. For this particular innovation, you can thank Henri Cretier and his anamorphoscope design from the 1920s, which is what eventuated into Cinemascope as we know it. Cinemascope was cheaper, it was simpler, and found a way to preserve the widescreen whilst doing away with all the complicated machinery. Basically, every studio jumped on a Cinemascope, except for Paramount, which was the studio behind Cinerama. Paramount felt that Cinemascope was just too grainy, and so decided to take a different approach. A new way of doing things means a new innovation for film stock. Enter VistaVision. Another year, another innovation. 1954, Paramount actually made the decision to take the film reel and turn it on its side. Yep, still using that same 35mm film gauge, Paramount was now able to shoot film that was 8 perfs wide. This led to an aspect ratio of 1.85, and because it used double the amount of film, far less grainy than Cinemascope. VistaVision was also hugely popular, being used by such great directors as Alfred Hitchcock in his films Vertigo and North by Northwest. Set a timer for another year later so that you'll be right on time for Todd AO. People are still hungry for bigger screens, wider aspect ratios, and sharper resolution. One such individual being producer Mike Todd. And if you're going to go bigger, you might as well go bigger. Todd did away with the 35mm gauge altogether and introduced the 70mm gauge, which not only had enough room for a nice 2.20 aspect ratio and enough space for a lot of detail and better resolution, but it also had more space for the soundtrack. Todd AO film stock was now able to store six separate soundtracks as opposed to the usual four. This meant that we could now introduce two additional speakers into theatres and introduce the idea of surround sound true surround sound to cinema. Amazing. Techniques to improve the affordability and quality of widescreen film stock continue to emerge for decades to come. Technoscope, made by Technicolor, made film cheaper at the expense of image quality by reducing the film perf to two. MGM partnered with Panavision to create Ultra Panavision, which used a 1.25 anamorphic squeeze onto film to create a whopping 2.76 aspect ratio. And then in the 1970s came Image Maximum also known as IMAX. IMAX was built for spectacle. It used a 65mm film gauge wound horizontally, similar to the VistaVision, but its biggest difference may be the fact that it moved its soundtrack onto its own designated film strip. IMAX is of course a novelty, requiring its own specific auditoriums to be built in order to display its films, but despite this, it is still a very popular medium and format to this day. Film history is complicated, and the history of film stock is no different. The lifeblood of the silver screen, film stock has been a constant source of innovation and redesign across independent inventors and major big budget studios alike. Although it may seem that every new technology supersedes its predecessors, what with digital appearing to have taken over from film stock in 1975 when it released, the truth is that every step of the evolutionary chain of film stock simply adds another tool to the tool belt of filmmakers everywhere, helping them tell the stories that they want to make. An example of this could be orthochromatic film. Although I said that it was phased out by 1930, it made a comeback in 2019 on Robert Eggers' film The Lighthouse, in which it added to the eerie atmosphere and the horror tones of the story. 
I hope this video gave you some better insight into the wonderfully convoluted history of film stock and how its development shaped cinema as we know it. Thank you for watching.